so hello, I'm Ilya. Um, I've come from Oxford. Um, so yeah, this is concentrating on fullerene. So we're talking about nanomaterials now rather than uh, your traditional material science. Uh, and it kind of blurs the lines at these length scales with chemistry. However, I feel like the, uh, the reason why I submitted the little review in the first place is that you can take kind of your material science approach in terms of how you're processing and your, therefore your property and structure, um, how that all links together to give applications. Um, and I think the range of applications which fullerenes can be used in, particularly just in this biomedical sense, is unprecedented actually for any material. So hopefully I'll give you a taste, I'll give you a kind of like an intro to what fullerenes are and how we can do them so that we're on a level playing field hopefully. Um, okay, so yeah, just I'm going to talk about what they are um, and how we can basically adapt these molecules to, uh, to use them. Uh, then I'll introduce you to uh, what, how we can use them as potential pharmaceuticals for medical applications. Give a very, very brief taste of what I'm doing with respect to all this. And going forward, which is kind of really the key to why I wrote the lit review, um, I'm going to make the case, argue the case for why research into fullerenes should really be propelled forward when you compare it to some other nanomaterials which people are looking at for medical applications. So, generic properties. So, um, hopefully we've all seen what a buckyball or a fullerene looks like. That's this thing here. So, the classic one is the 60 carbon cage. So, the fullerenes are actually a family of carbon materials. And they can contain any number of, uh, not any number, but a number of um, carbon atoms, 60, 70 are the two most abundant. 60 is the classic one, and they're all made up of subunits of hexagons and pentagons, uh, which we can see here. And this is carbon. And you can really beautifully see what C60 looks like in a nuclear magnetic resonance spectrum. And basically what this single peak shows is that every single carbon environment in the C60 cage is the same. And that is, that's basically proof of its incredibly highly symmetric structure. Just to show you the difference, if we then move to 70, that's 10 extra carbon atoms which we've added across the middle of the cage. And you can see I've split it up there into five separate carbon environments. So each in those little things, each carbon environment is the same, and those show up as five peaks on the carbon spectrum. Um, and basically, depending on what, how many carbon atoms you have, uh, you can get a whole host of different properties. A, the most nicest one to look at visually are its electronic properties. So this is the fact that they have different um, absorption spectra in solution. So we have a nice purple, you can't really see it in this light, but purple, then like a wine red for C70, and the higher fullerenes tend to be the yellow or green or stuff like that. Um, their solubilities and their um, reactivities also change. As you go to bigger cages, things become basically, they become less spherical, they become more like graphene, like graphite, they become less reactive. This plays a role in adapting them to what we use. How do we actually make these things? Okay, they're beautiful, beautiful. They're about a nanometer across. But the process by which you make them is incredibly violent. It's, this is our setup in our lab. It's called arc discharge. And in this chamber, you basically have two graphite electrodes next to each other, and you blast a huge direct current through them to hundreds of amps. And nobody still knows what the mechanism of formation is of these things, which is a bit of a hamper when it comes to scaling up the process uh, for certain fullerenes, which I'll talk about later. But we know that we can collect them, and it basically creates a big black sooty mess, which you collect. 20% of that by mass is uh, soluble. And we take that, and those are fullerenes. We can then process them, and about roughly, depending on your process, about 60% is C60, 25% is C70. That leaves 15% of higher cages, and what are called metallofullerenes, which I'll talk about, which is when you can capture a metal atom inside the cage. And I'll talk about what they are. So. We can actually functionalize these things. We've got these cages, these are great. I'm just, it's very nice to look at uh, and it's some cool science, but we want to do something useful with them. And the beauty about fullerenes is that given their electronic structure, you can actually change them on the outside and the inside. On the inside, they're very inert, which means that we can capture um, species in there, atomic, ionic, and molecular. Um, and so that is endohedral functionalization. And exohedral functionalization is attaching things onto the outside. So they actually behave like uh, any sort of normal, like you learn in GCSE, an alkene. So just a nice carbon carbon double bond. And you can do standard alkene chemistry on them. So it involves a lot of you dissolve your fullerenes into solution. And it's basically a lot of solution based wet chemistry. Now, the driving force for adding things, adding molecules to the outside of these cages, is the strain in these systems. These are incredibly strained molecules. About 80% of the heat of formation is in that strain. Um, if you imagine, the reason why it's all strained is the, the introduction of these pentagons. 
if it was all hexagons, it would be graphene, it would be flat, or you could roll it up into a nanotube. So additions then occur across what we call this 6-6 bond, so between two hexagons, rather than between a hexagon and a pentagon. Um, and those are the ones that behave like double bonds. 6-5 bonds are single bonds, so we don't worry about them. Um, and, I mean, the, there is a whole library of reactions that you can do to functionalize these things. Uh, one which I particularly like and which I work with quite a lot and which people generally work with is what we call the Bingle reaction, which is demonstrated here. And it's nice because it's really mild. It's room temperature reaction. You can get decent yields. And you can functionalize these R groups here to give whatever it is that you may want. In endohedral functionalization, so this is now capturing things within the inside of the cage, you could concentrate, as I said, on atomic species and on molecular species. That, in terms of the uh, medical applications, hasn't got a lot going for it, so I don't focus on that. What we do talk about is our EMFs, so endohedral metallofullerenes. And generally, you, um, you can capture what we call the, well, the lanthanide elements inside. Um, and what you do is that, you know those graphite rods that I was talking about, is that you pack them with a metal precursor, a metal oxide precursor. And then in that process of burning the graphite rods, Again, we don't know how, um, but metal atoms basically get captured inside a cage, and you can isolate these things. Another one is um, what we call TNT EMF, so trimetallic nitride EMFs. So this is where rather than just the monometallic iron inside, we actually have a mixture of ions as a nitride form inside the cage. Now, the endohedral fullerenes have different properties. Um, to empty cages because these metals inside actually transfer some of their charge to the cage. This changes their reactivities and their solubilities. So this is kind of like a primer in fullerene uh, science before we actually get onto the applications. So hopefully with that in mind, we can kind of think, we can now basically attach things onto the outside and put things on the inside. How is this useful for medical applications? The blood is mainly water, okay? If anything is gonna go into the body, you have to make it soluble. In water, therefore, so that you can ideally do intravenous injection. The two main aims that we would go for there are to maximise your ability to hyd uh, hydrogen bond with water. That's actually not necessarily all the case, always the case, because for some purposes you may want a bit of lipophilicity, so a kind of greasiness. So it's not always it can't hydrogen bond. Um, and the ideal aim is to go for these things to the pharmaceutical market. These are well-defined molecular structures. I can't stress that enough. I didn't. I stressed it quite a lot in my review as well. Um, unlike other nanomaterials, which I'll talk about at the end, the fullerenes are well-defined molecular structures. And what we want to do is to be able to add things onto the outside such that they're still well-defined and we can make them in high yield. So you can make these things water-soluble, as I just said. The one that I really want is exohedral functionalization, covalently attaching molecules to the outside of these cages. Other two methods which have been done before include complexation in water-soluble hosts. Very good, you get nice water-soluble things. And incorporation into water-soluble polymers. Again, perfectly fine, you get water-soluble stuff. The issue is, is that in the body's conditions, these com how do we know that these complexes basically don't decomplexate? In which case you could release raw fullerene by itself, which under certain conditions, you don't know how it's gonna behave. You don't know how the complex complexing agent itself is gonna behave. With polymers, you have a molecular weight distribution. Uh, again, that's not well defined. You don't know what the kind of, as I say, pharmacokinetic behavior is, how, well it, how well it will interact with different things in the body. So just to take three structures out of my lit review, which, um, which have been done before, just common ma methods of water solubilizing fullerenes. Really common one is this one, it's a polyhydroxylated. So it's basically just attaching these uh, hydroxyl groups and adding as many as you can onto the cage. Great, but you get a, again, a distribution of the number of additions to the cage, which isn't well defined. It takes lengthy processing to isolate one structure. This one is C3. It's C3 because of its symmetry. Um, this one has been favoured, actually, in empty cage uh, fullerene studies for biomedical applications at the moment. Again, this is just three what we call malonic acid groups attached to the cage, and that's nicely water-soluble. And then another one, which is pretty cool, I think, uh, is this dendrofullerene. So you actually don't try and maximize your water soluble additions to the cage, but you make one addition and then water solubilize that. So as you can imagine, this thing at the bottom is still fairly greasy, so to say, so not water soluble. Okay, why are we using these things? That's the key thing, okay? I've told you how we can get them into the body, but why do we actually want to use them? They have some pretty cool properties. So I've broken it down there into 
This is nearly all of the ones I included in the review. There are a few more. On the therapeutic side of things, the first ever positive kind of application of these fullerenes was as an inhibitor of a HIV enzyme. And the reason being is that the cage actually happens to perfectly fit into the active site of this enzyme, therefore inhibiting it from doing its thing, basically. For HIV, that's quite a good thing. Um, and so basically, this addition here, this was one of the first ones that they made in 93. This gives it water solubility to get it actually into the body, and then it actually acts by this locking in on the, uh, on the active site. Over the years, like, they've tried to optimize that, but it hasn't really, again, this hasn't really been pushed Anyway, I must stress actually straight away that none of these have been tested in clinic uh, in human patients. This is all either in vitro or in animal studies. The other one, or oh, another example, is photodynamic therapy. So fullerenes basically have this, due to their electronic structure, they don't, unlike some other um, organic molecules, when they absorb uh, radiation, they don't then fluoresce straight away. If they go to the excited singlet state, they don't fluoresce, they have this thing called intersystem crossing, and what this can do, it can transfer energy to oxygen, which surrounds them. When it transfers energy, you create singlet oxygen. Singlet oxygen is incredibly toxic to cells, so you could use this for killing tumor cells. It's basically one big thing, so that's what we call photodynamic therapy. You irradiate your fullerene, you inject it into a tumor, irradiate it, and it kills the cells. That's been shown to work. Um, another one is chemotherapy, so this actually is very similar to the uh, HIV protease inhibitor in that that inhibits, that has been shown actually to inhibit this hydroxylated fullerene here, uh, to inhibit um, pancreatic cancer metastasis, so uh, to do with the enzymes there. And the other big one is antioxidants. So Laura Dugan has pioneered some work in America on, uh, this is really cool actually, so what it does is it's a radical, it's what we call a radical sponge, due to its structure it can readily accept radicals. So just like it can create single oxygen species, it can also absorb reactive oxygen species, if you like, it soaks them up. And re these reactive oxygen species are very prevalent, they, they're believed to be a key kind of like step in the pathway of neurodegenerative disorders. And so this C3 again has actually been shown to slow down the onset of Parkinson's in primate models, which is pretty cool. Um, on the diagnostics front, a key one which I will Lord again at the end is for MRI uh, contrast agents. So if you've ever gone for an MRI scan, hopefully not, but if you have, then you're often injected with a contrast agent in order to make the picture better. And what happens is that that is actually just a gadolinium chelate. So the gadolinium basically relaxes the water protons which surround it, and it does this in this chelated state. Now the thing is, in this chelated state, is that it can actually become unbound. It can become loose. Now, gadolinium, if you have um, kidney problems, is fatal. So you can't have a contrast-improved contrast MRI scan if you have kidney problems. If you capture gadolinium inside a fullerene cage, it can never escape. That's great. That's one benefit. The other benefit is actually people have water-solubilized these gadolinium fullerenes, so the at sign means that the metal is within the cage. Um, and the contrast is actually two orders of magnitude better than the agents which are currently available. Um, this is great. I'll tell you why, where the problems arise at the end. Um, and then other cool things. This is more kind of the, what you'd call true nanomedicine. Why nanotechnology is particularly wanted in this region is combining more than one thing. So here you can see that MRI is provided by, by the gadolinium and brachytherapy, which you could think of as almost internal radiotherapy, uh, is provided by this radioactive, radioactive lutetium that releases uh, its beta emission, which can kill um, cells. Uh, dual modal imaging, so again you attach radioactive iodine, that's for uh, PET scans, and kind of the holy grail, if you like, of nanomedicine, which is targeted therapy, where we have just a standard chemotherapeutic drug, which is DOX. Uh, so that does its chemotherapy thing. The fullerene you use fo for photodynamic therapy, so for killing tumor cells as well. And the whole point is that the f you want this, you can inject it into your body, but it would just go round and round and round and not do anything useful. You want it going somewhere. So the folic acid here has been shown to attach to certain types of tumour. Okay, so that's hopefully just a taste of kind of what, what can be done. I will very, 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 very briefly do, do say what I'm doing. This is just some unpublished stuff. So what I'm trying to do is get this control to the additions of the cage. So I've come up with this, um, this molecule here, which I've called the crab, hopefully for obvious reasons. Um, and a nice thing is that I can, I can get control over how many additions I make. And it's quite nice in that each, depending on the number you attach, they're a different colour. 
And I'm currently working on trying to water solubilize these. So this comes with functionalizing these ester groups here. Um, and I've succeeded to a certain extent. Um, another thing is that with this crab, I looked at it and it actually looks like quite a good binding ligand. Um, and this is just a, um, I'm doing, I'm in the process of doing the um, experimental uh, workup. But actually, if you could bind physiologically important cations, such as calcium, um, and in this case, this one's ammonium, not that important, but it's still important, you could potentially, this could become part of a, maybe a supramolecular sensor, or stuff like that. So that's stuff I'm working on. And then the other one, which you may not think is relevant exactly, but it actually is, is some work that I'm doing in collaboration with chemistry. And this, these are what we call molecular machines. And if you can include basically what this is here, I won't go into too much detail, you can move these macrocycles along the chain, and it switches on and off a vis visible fluorescent response when you bind chloride ions. Chloride ions are very important for controlling the water content of cells. And we've shown that in an organic solvent system, and the whole point why this is relevant is that the fullerene can actually become the key water solubilizing component of that system. So again, that's something we're working on. If we can get that to work in the body, that would be lovely. So, why do I believe that fullerenes are actually kind of the, the thing for um, medical applications? So I didn't, I mentioned it in the literature review um, towards the end, and I did, haven't gone into particular detail here as to why they're better, but this well-defined molecular structure is really key when you compare it to other nanomaterials which people are um, kind of proposing. I'm talking about graphene, so graphene flakes. These can be of, you don't quite know how they're functionalized on the edges, uh, they could be of various sizes, so that's no good. If you're going to put it into a body, you need a definite defined structure. This is what drug companies want. Carbon nanotubes can be of different lengths. They can be of different chiralities. They can be either capped or not. Again, when you functionalize them, how many have you got on every nanotube? Difficult to tell. Quantum dots, um, such as cadmium selenide, which people are using for fluorescent responses. Cadmium and selenide or selenium are two horrible, uh, very toxic substances. So putting them into the body not particularly safe. The library of possible structures that you can get from adding stuff onto the outside is effectively limitless. It's only down to your imagination as to how you want to functionalize it and for what purpose you want to use it. That's a benefit. Endohedral, and this is the big one, which I think really we will see actually fairly soon, is the inclusion of gadolinium with, into these fullerene cages. Because as I said, if you, have a, if you have kidney problems and you need a contrast agent scan, like you're screwed basically, which isn't very nice. Um, so if you can get gadolinium inside the cage and the fact that it actually gives better performance is a good thing. Um, and yeah, it's just that basically you can use it for such a wide range of things. Why do we not use them? Making these EMFs in particular is really, really difficult. Uh, the, so as you saw on one of the first slides, so 20% of this soot which is produced is fullerenes of which 60%, well, 85% is either C60 or C70. The rest is higher fullerenes, and if you dope them, then that 15% fraction can also contain EMFs, but that's it. So we're talking about milligram scales at the moment. If you do enough um, burns of the carbon rods, you could get to grams, which we had a master's student doing, um, but other than that, it's very, very difficult. So we need to understand, ideally, how we actually made these things. Um, the other one is controllably adding multiple groups onto the site. So I've shown that I'm working towards trying to do that, and other people have maybe added one, two, or three. Um, but again, doing that in good yield is a, big, is a big challenge. One which is often overlooked is the fact that actually there is some research out there which suggests that when it comes to, if you mention the word nanotechnology and it involves being put into your body, people get scared. Uh, so like the... Eric Drexler, who people call the godfather of nanotechnology, was a guy who famously wrote a sentence to do with grey goo, like these self-replicating robots which are going to take over the world. And that was in the 80s, and that is still the pervading feeling, uh, according to research, of what people think um, about nanotechnology. And the other one is, um, I put this down because I think it is quite important, is that actually, from talking just to a few uh, representatives from pharma companies, they don't know a lot about nanotechnology. Um, and by nanotechnology, I mean these nanomaterial-based things. Um, and in the case of fullerenes, I think it's such a, a potential powerful material in terms of as a base uh, to start working with that people should know about it, um, and which is why I argued the case for it in this uh, lit review. Um, 
And that is it. So yeah, thank. I just want to thank the group um, and the people that have helped me, and yeah, EPS, SRC for funding, and everybody here for for today. So thank you. Thank you very much.